Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Two Beers for Buster by William Campbell Galt It isn't only that you're a detective, she said, but you knew him in training camp. You were a friend of his, weren't you? I knew him, I said. He hadn't had many friends, I thought, but didn't say. Not after the time he'd been caught with phony dice. He died at Tarawa, she said. He was buried there. That's why none of it makes sense. Tarawa was three years back, November 43. I studied her. I wondered how a lug like Buster Cowan had ever made this leak. A honey blonde, small and trim, dressed in beautiful taste, all woman, all lovely. I said, some angle shooter, some racketeer. I made some marks on my scratch pad. I'd ignore it. It's a bad neighborhood. I looked up to meet her gaze fully. Mrs. Cowan, your husband never made any secret of the fact that he was well-to-do. One of his former buddies is probably in trouble and is working this angle. If you want, I'll go over and see this fellow, but I'd recommend the police. She looked down at her hands, folded in her lap. She looked up. I'm not sure I want the police in this, she said. I could understand that. Buster had left a lot of money, but none of it was clean. She dressed like a woman who needed a lot of money. Okay, I told her. I'll run over there this afternoon and find out what he wants. I'll phone you. She nodded and rose. Will it be a retainer or do you prefer to bill me later? I told her I'd bill her later and she left. I sat there thinking back four years. Most of our cycle and training camp had gone east to Europe through Fort Dix, but Buster and one other had gone west through Fort Ord. Who had that other one been? The name eluded me, but I remembered him. A big boy from out on the coast somewhere. Outside, the wind was working itself into a gale. It was November, and anything can happen in November in this town. I went out, locking the door behind me and down the steps to the street. There were a few broken branches in the road and dead leaves lining the gutters. There was a black Lincoln Continental convertible parked directly behind my coupe. Somebody was slumming. My neighborhood doesn't support Lincolns. I climbed into the coupe and headed towards the Hotel Metropole. The coupe fought the wind all the way. On 8th, I had to detour because of a huge branch which had crashed. Then I was driving along Front Street, which follows the river. It's a neighborhood of cheap rooming houses and crummy hotels, of sailors' taverns and missions and small garment shops. One of the crummiest hotels was the Metropole. It was an ancient wooden structure with a cupola, weather-beaten, beginning to tilt on its foundation. A faded sign proclaimed rooms by the day or week. Only two gilt letters remained of the Hotel Metropole on the grimy front lobby window. I parked the coupe close to the entrance. The water of the river was choppy. The odor from the river was strong and unpleasant. I lit a cigarette and stepped out into the wind. The odor was stronger, and I was glad for the cigarette. There was no one behind the desk in the lobby, but there was a bell and a sign. The sign said, Ring for service, which I did. A fat man in a pair of shiny pants and blue work shirt came through the back behind the desk and looked at me blankly. I'm here to see Mr. Sam Nelson, I explained. He expecting you? The eyes still blank. I lied with a nod. His head inclined towards the stairs. Second floor, back. Room 218. He turned and went through the door again. The stairs were covered with the shreds of carpeting. I followed them up into the musty dimness of the second floor hall. Down the hall to 218 where I knocked. The door opened almost immediately and a big man stood framed there. A big man with small eyes wearing a dirty white shirt and a two-day growth of beard and a scowl. Surprise swiftly guarded in the small eyes. Red Bear, you old! He tried to smile, but it was work. I knew him. It was the man who'd gone to Ord with Buster. I couldn't remember the name, but I knew it wasn't Sam Nelson. I groped for it while he said, What brought you here? How'd you know I was here? 
I didn't, I said. Mrs. Cowan sent me. I'm working for her. There was no sound but the wind. He stared at me, then stepped aside. Come in, he said, and I went in. A chipped enameled bed, a leaning washstand, with a bull on it, a bathing girl calendar on the wall, a rug that seemed to be growing on the floor like moss, an acrid odor, two kitchen chairs formerly white. He indicated one of the chairs, and I took it, shook his head staring at me, then. You pitch in in that league? You making time with that broad? I shook my head. I'm a private detective. I'm working for her. He swore, he said. A private eye, and swore again. No, he said. Mm, I'm not working through no copper. I shrugged. That's what she wants. What have you got that's worth money to her? Buster's dead. She got his money. If it's a piece of his character you're trying to peddle her, you won't get far. What's a dead man's character? He didn't answer that. He said, I want to talk to her. You tell her that. If she don't want to come here, I'll go and see her. But I'm not working through no copper. You went to Ord with Buster, didn't you? I probed. Did you ship out from there with him, too? He didn't answer. He stared at me stubbornly. He reached over for a pack of cigarettes on the bed and brought one up to his mouth. He was staring at me again, and then his eyes went past me toward the door and grew wide and filled with horror. Sound exploded from behind me, and I hit the floor, rolling for the bed for coverage. There were three shots altogether. The smell of powder still lingered in the room, overpowering the other odors. Mike Marcotti, alias Sam Nelson, still lay on the floor, two holes in his face and one in his neck. Lieutenant of Detectives Jeremiah Cost was a thin man of medium height and a little better than medium mentality. He took me out into the hall, away from the others. He asked, You on a job? I admitted it. Tell me how it was. I told him how it was. After I felt safe, I finished. I went to the window in the hall there. I saw this black Lincoln convertible going up the block like a bat out of hell. You get the number? I hadn't, I told him. He studied the threadbare green carpet on the floor. Who's your client? I hesitated. I told him. Cowan's widow, huh? That's right. Stay here, he said, and went back into the room. A moment later, he reappeared. Come on, we'll take a run out and see her. Outside, the wind was steadier, less gusty. Cuss dead. If it's all right with you, we'll take your car. I'll leave the department car here. I said it was all right with me. We followed the front street to the avenue, and the avenue down to the drive. We followed the drive all the way out to Shore Hills, an upper-middle-class suburb to Shore Hills, with a small shopping district and a scattered residential district. The Cowan home was Georgian, red brick, white trim, set well back from the street, a little more pretentious than its neighbors. Koss said, I'll do the talking, and led the way to the front door. Dead leaves swished dryly as they swept across the gray grass. A girl in a fawn-colored uniform answered Cost ring. She said gravely, Mrs. Cowan is resting right now. She isn't feeling very well. Cost displayed his badge. The girl nodded without perceptible interest or emotion and held the door wide. We went into a small entrance hall and through that to the living room. It was a long, wide room, furnished an early American motif. Cheerful, but not comfortable. Cost and I sat on a maple, bright cushioned Davenport while the maid went to get Mrs. Cowan. Koss lighted a panatella, blew smoke at the ceiling, saying nothing, looking thoughtfully, ignoring me. She came in presently, wearing a blue robe and mules, her honeyed hair up. A contrast, I thought, with this homey, neat house, because she had poise, but she also had fire. Maybe she had the poise because she was afraid of the fire. I speculated on that. Cost and I rose, and Koss said, Just a few questions, Mrs. Cowan. His voice wasn't so matter-of-fact now. She said, Is it about... about that man who phoned that Nelson? Koss nodded. I'd like to have your story on that. She took a chair near the fireplace, and we sat down again on the springless Davenport. She looked at her hands in her lap and said, He phoned me yesterday morning. He said he had some information that would be valuable to me. Did he say what it was about? The blonde head rose slowly, and she looked directly at Koss. He said it was about my husband. He said I was in danger. Koss said nothing. He said I should come down there and see him, that it wasn't safe for him to come up here. I didn't know what to do. She looked out her hands again. I remembered that Mr. Barry had been a friend of Buster's, and I went to see him. I thought he was a private detective. He was, and is, Koss said. Well, there's been a murder, Mrs. Cowan. There's nothing private about a murder. 
silence in the room. The sound of the dying wind outside. Her head came up slowly. The blue eyes were wide and dark. Murder, she whispered. Koss nodded. This Nelson's real name was Marcotti. He's a hoodlum, an ex-pug. He was killed about an hour ago, while Red, Mr. Barry, was talking to him. She looked at me in a way. Her hands were no longer in her lap, but clenching the arms of the chair. The poise was gone, but the fire was there. Murder, she repeated, and put her face into her hands. Koss said, if there's anything else you know, now would be the time to tell it. There's nothing, she said, her face still hidden. I guess that my husband's business wasn't always legal, but there's nothing I know about it. And now? Why should they bother me now? That's what we mean to find out, Koss said. That's why I want all the information you have. A few drops of rain spattered on the windows. The wind had brought it in. Some of Mrs. Cowan's poise had returned and she faced Koss reasonably. One man I know my husband feared, a Jess Revolt, a gambler. But my husband is dead. He died in the service of his country. Cost dead cigar, rolled in his mouth. Jess Revolt? He said and seemed to be trying to place a name. He live in this town? I believe so, he did, when my husband was alive. Cost rose, and I rose with him, Cost said. We'll do all we can on this, Mrs. Cowan. There might be some more questions later. She nodded and accompanied us to the door. She said to me, Call me later, won't you? I'm afraid I'll still need you. I promised her I would. Cost and I hurried down through the rain to my car, he said. Take me to the station. They must be all through at the Metropole by now. We drove for a while in silence and I asked, How'd you know this Marcati? He's no local mug, is he? He was for a long time. Then he went out to the coast. He and his brother ran a policy game here. I said, he was drafted from the coast. He was in our training cycle at Camp Walters. That's an angle, he said. I think I'll send a wire or two to the War Department. No change in his casual voice. Why do you suppose she still wants you on the job? I don't know. I'll let you know as soon as I do. He nodded. There was no further conversation until I pulled up in front of the station. Then, getting out, he said, Some babe, huh, Red? First rate, I admitted. He turned to face me and said, Watch your step there, Red and was hurrying up the walk to the wide door. Me and my reputation. I drove back through the rain to the office. From there I phoned Mrs. Cowan. I said, I don't quite understand just why you'd need me further, Mrs. Cowan. A silence. Then, I have a feeling that it isn't finished. I'm frightened, Mr. Barry. Okay, I said. I'll dig at it. This Marcotti may have some friends. I asked, you don't by any chance know anyone who drives a black Lincoln convertible, do you? A longer silence this time. A hell of a long silence. I don't know why, but I knew she was lying when she finally said, No, I don't. Outside, the rain came down. In my office, the radiator began to hiss. I went over to the washbowl in the corner to wash my hands. I had my back to the door while I was doing this. When I turned to reach for a towel, I saw the man near the doorway. Thin and fairly short, dark and oily, looking as though he had come for trouble. I stood there staring, saying nothing. Who killed him, he said. His hands were at his sides and empty, but the threat of a gun was somehow implied. Who killed Mike? I shook my head. I don't know. I'm being paid to find out. Who are you? His brother, he said. Who's paying you, copper? I said nothing. I started to walk toward my desk. His hand went to a coat pocket and I continued to walk as calmly as I could. I sat down in my chair behind the desk. He said, I've followed you out to that place in Shore Hills. She lives there, doesn't she? Cowan's widow? This is all a part of that Cowan business. What Cowan business? I asked him. If you know something about him, I'd be glad to pay for it. Never mind what I know. What do you know, copper? I know it's raining, I said. I know you'd be a damn fool if you pulled that gun out of your pocket. Maybe what you've got together makes a story? The way it looks to me, we should work together. With a cop, he sneered. Me work with the law? I'm not the law, I said. I'm a private operative. You smell like the law to me, he said. What the babe have to say? She doesn't know anything, I told him calmly. She doesn't know as much as you do. Weren't you working with your brother? I didn't even know he was in town. His eyes moved around the room and came back to my fate. 
How about Jess Rebolt? Never heard of him, I lied. If you didn't know your brother was in town, how could you have followed me out to Shore Hills? You must have been in the neighborhood of the Metropole. I got the word, he said, in time to get over there. Did you get over there in a black Lincoln convertible, I asked? No, he looked puzzled. How does that figure? I don't know, I said. I was just making sound. He walked over close to the desk. His eyes were bright, and he was trembling. Start making some sense, monkey. I don't like your lip. I tried not to look as nervous as I felt. I tried to keep my voice level. The drawer of my desk was open now, and my hand was in the drawer. I brought up my thirty-eight. Maybe this makes sense to you, I said. His hand was still in his pocket, and he didn't move a muscle. I said, I have a license for mine. I can use it in self-defense. Take your hand out of your pocket. Take it out empty. His hand came out slowly and dropped out of sight. All right, I said. What did you mean by the Cowan business? He was still trembling in his eyes. I lost none of their luster, he said. Cowan and my brother went some pitch together. They took revolt for fifty grand. That was before the war. Revolt's been on the trail ever since. I studied him, trying to determine if he was lying. He asked again, How does the Lincoln figure? It was none of his business, I knew, but I thought if I told him, he'd be more with me than against me. In my business, I don't spurn allies. I told him how the Lincoln figured. He looked at the top of my desk and at me. He was nervously chewing his lip, and some of the brightness was gone from his eyes. Revolt drives the Lincoln, he said. The rain had stopped. A low sun glinted off the wet window panes. I said, I'll give that to the law. Stay away from revolt. The police will take care of him. He didn't answer by so much as a nod. He turned his back on the gun I held and quietly walked from the room. I heard him go down the stairs, and I went to the front window. He was driving a convertible himself, I saw, but it wasn't a Lincoln. I called the department and got my cost. I told him about the revolt angle. I should have saved my breath. We've got the call out for him now, he said. He looks like the man I want. I think we can wrap this one up. I thought so, too. I went out to supper. After supper, I called Mrs. Cowan from the restaurant and told her all the angles. The police will handle it from here, and I explained. I'll send you a bill for the one day's work. No, she said. I'm not satisfied with that. Will you come out tonight and see me? I said I could be there in a half hour if it was all right with her. That was all right with her. She was wearing a black wool, soft wool dress when I got there. She was wearing a rather disturbing perfume, not quite strong enough to hide the odor of whiskey on her breath. She looked frightened. The shades were down in the living room. We sat in there. She lit a cigarette from a nearly empty pack and offered me one which I refused. She didn't look at me, but at the cigarette, as she said, I know Mr. Revolt drove a Lincoln convertible. He came here to see me once. I said nothing. She looked at me. He said that Buster owed him $40,000. He thought I should pay it. I heard it as 50000 I said. She nodded. That's what it was originally. But he said that Buster had sent him 10000 from the coast before he shipped out. He wanted the rest from me. She took a puff of the cigarette, a deep puff. I wouldn't have paid it if I had it, and I didn't have it. Fair enough, I said. But what that's got to do with now? Everything's washed up. If Mike Marcotti knew something about Buster, he's not been able to tell it. It wouldn't be wise for you to get mixed up with any of Buster's playmates. No percentage in it. How about Mike's brother? Maybe he knows something? Knows what? Nothing that will help you. Nothing with which you should be concerned. I don't know, she said quietly. She rubbed her forehead with the back of one hand. I don't know. She bit her lower lip. I never heard from Buster. Not a line. After he left California. That could be explained. Yes, of course. But you know... He was listed as missing first. It was an ammunition dump that blew up. They never made positive identification. There were no fingerprints available. I wondered if perhaps... She must have loved him, I thought. She must still be carrying the torch, I said gently. Even if he wasn't killed at Tarawa, he'd never be able to leave there on anything but government transportation. He'd never make it. Were you thinking he might have deserted? Again, she rubbed her forehead. I don't know what I was thinking. I was feeling more than thinking. What else could Mike Marcotti have told me? Maybe I said, he knew where Buster had some cash in now. Maybe he knew something that would be worth money to you and to him. 
well, I was talking. Some part of my brain must have been elsewhere, because it came up with the idea. Just a crazy half idea at first, and then it began to grow. It was fantastic, and my mind wanted to reject it, but it persisted. She said, There's more in this thing than we know. Much more. I'm frightened. I don't know why. Call it intuition. Her voice rose. Call it insanity if you want. But I think Buster is alive. She'd been drinking. She was worked up to nervous pitch. Her words could be discounted, should be discounted. There was no reason for me to feel that they might be true. It's highly improbable, I told her. I was telling myself at the same time. It's impossible. The cigarette was out now, and she put it in a well-filled ashtray. She covered her eyes with one hand. I said, It's something you wanted to believe so badly that you've worked yourself into a mental state. She looked up. Her smile was bitter. Mental state? You mean insanity? Not insanity, I said evenly. You're nervous, upset. You need a rest. To get away from this town, you need a trip. She nodded slowly. Her eyes were directed downward. She said, I'm afraid in this house. I want to leave. She looked at me defiantly, but I won't leave. I want to be here if Buster comes back. I felt a chill and tried to ignore it. I said, if Buster came back, it would mean he was a deserter. I don't care about that, she said. It wouldn't matter. Her voice thickened. Maybe he won't come back. Alive. The word seemed to stay in the room with us. I looked at the drawn shades, at the filled ashtray. I smelled the whiskey in the air. This luscious, lovely blonde and that, that jerk. What did he have? What had he had? Women, I will never understand. She said, I want you to talk to Mike Marcotti's brother. I'll pay whatever. He wants if he can tell me what Mike Marcotti was going to tell me. All right, I said and rose. This idea grew bigger and bigger in my mind, and all the day's business seemed to support it. I picked up my hat. I'll try to find Marcotti, I promised. I'll do all I can. Thank you, she said softly. I knew you were a friend of Buster's. I remained outwardly composed. Inside, I winced. She walked with me to the door. She locked it securely after me. It was dark out, no moon, no stars. The light from the street lamp, distant and hazy. A gentle wind stirred the leaves, littering the walk, making a dry grating sound. I thought, we all had a delay in route. Buster had one, too. Eighteen days from the finish of the training cycle to the day we hit the POE. But who'd be sucker enough, although for enough money? I went down the walk to the curb. I walked around to the driver's side of the coupe and opened the door. There was a shadow in the coupe, a crouching shadow, below the window level. Light glinted faintly off a gun barrel. The shadow said, Get in and drive. Drive up to the corner and turn right. Stop a half a block down on Parkway. I didn't argue. It wasn't the kind of voice that one argued with. I drove up to the corner and turned right. A half block down, I stopped and cut the motor. There was a long black sedan parked there, the motor running. The shadow said, Get out on my side. He opened the door and stepped out backward, keeping the gun trained on me. I climbed out. I could see the shadow more distinctly now. I thought I could recognize him. Jed Abel, a grifter and gunman. The man who held open the door of the big sedan I didn't recognize. He was blonde and broad and tall. He had a face that seemed entirely devoid of emotion, a stone face. Jed said, Get in the back. I started to climb in. That was when stone face sapped me. That's when the sky rockets went off in my mind. I was playing ball. I was pitching. The ball seemed to be made of velvet or velour, fuzzy to the touch but hard underneath. I threw my clincher, my fast one, right down the groove, and this giant at the plate smashed it right back at me. I tried to duck. I tried to protect myself, and I turned, but it caught me in the temple, and I went down. Then it was raining. My face was wet. The manager was sopping my face with a cold, wet towel. It was Jed Abel, all right. He had a wet cloth in his hand, and he was stroking my forehead, my temples. He looked back over his shoulder to say, He's coming around, boss. My hands were flat, palms downward, on the floor, and it was a fine rug under their touch. Jed said, the rug's getting wet, boss. A chuckle, a hearty voice. A little water won't hurt a royal cash on, Jed. You can quit now. Jed stepped out of my line of vision. The light was dim from two floor lamps. 
Stoneface sat on a long, low Davenport. The boss sat next to him. He was a big man, this one who'd chuckled, looking well-fed, well-clothed, and content. He had light eyes and a dark tanned face and a mouth like a woman's, well-shaped and soft. He was smiling down at me as he asked, Think you could get up now? I'm sure my friend here underestimated his strength. Stoneface permitted himself a smile, a stony smile. He was smoking, watching the end of his cigarette carefully. I tried to get up, and the fireworks sputtered in my brain again. I put one hand to the floor and pushed. Then Jed came over to help me to a chair. I sat down and closed my eyes. When I opened them again, Jed was near the door. The other two sat quietly in the Davenport waiting. I rubbed the back of my neck. The boss said, you seem determined to pin a murder charge on me, Mr. Barry. I had you brought here so I could find out why. I don't even know you, I said. The womanish lips pursed. You identified my car. A gun, registered in my name, was found in the hall of the Hotel Metropole. It was the gun used to kill Mike Marcotti. I had known about the gun, I said. You're Jeff Revolt? He nodded. Stoneface put his cigarette out carefully. Revolt, watching him, said, You smoke too much, Danny. It's bad for you. Then he turned to me. We'll have your story now, Mr. Barry. Despite his manners, he was no one to defy. I gave him the story straight. When I'd finished, he looked thoughtful. He said, You aren't carrying a gun. I rarely do. He nodded thoughtfully. You weren't expecting trouble then? I thought it was all washed up. Mrs. Cowan believes that Buster is still alive. And it might be, but the odds are against it. Alive? The soft mouth was slack in disbelief. How could that possibly be? Buster, I said, went to Fort Ord, practically alone from our class at Camp Walters. He had a delay en route. He had enough time to find a stooge to take his place. The stooge would need to be a man with some military experience to get by and enough need for the money to take a chance. He'd report in at Fort Ord as Buster Cowan. He'd die at Tarawa as Buster Cowan. Revolt looked at Danny. Danny lit another cigarette and Revolt looked at me. You said practically alone, Mr. Barry. Who else went to Fort Ord with Buster? Mike Marcotti, I said. The pale blue eyes were darker now. They were on stone face. What do you think of that story, Danny? Danny shrugged. Danny looked tight and nervous. Revolt chuckled again. Quite a story. This Marcotti would be the only one who knew, wouldn't he? Mike? And his brother, I said. His brother came to see me this afternoon. Near the door, Jed Abel moved quietly. There was a gun in his hand, and he was alert. My headache throbbed rhythmically. Revolt's smile was a strange, cold contortion. Would you like to hear another story, Mr. Barry? I shrugged. Why not? I'm not going any place. He said, Danny here brought me $10,000 from Buster Cowan as a partial payment on a debt. Danny also brought me a message... The message was that Buster would be back after the war to clear the rest of the debt up. He looked at Stoneface. Am I right? Stoneface nodded, his eyes straight ahead. Revolt looked at me. I gave Danny a job with me. He's a remarkable young man. He's risen very rapidly in my organization. He shook his head. I wonder what happened to Buster. I don't know, I said. But if he were smart, he'd have gone to a first-rate plastic surgeon and have his face made over. He might even come back to his own hometown and get a job with his old rival. He might even frame his old rival and take over the business. On the Davenport, Danny stirred. Near the door, Jed Abel was taut and braced. Revolt was musing aloud. He might at that. He'd have the keys to my car and access to my guns. He'd hear through my organization that Mike Marcotti was in town. It wouldn't be difficult for a man in a trusted position silence a heavy silence i broke the silence i said i remember buster's voice don't you remember buster's voice mr revolt he sighed i don't i'm not as observant as a man in my position should be he turned do you remember buster's voice danny danny shook his head nervously answer politely danny don't just shake your head do you remember buster's voice silence i waited revolt waited at the door gun raised jed abel waited the rest is still confused to me. I heard the explosion and saw Jed Abel go slamming back into the wall near the door. I saw him fold. I heard revolts, damn it, almost petulantly, and I saw Danny moving for the door, his back to it, his heavy automatic trained on revolt. 
Revolt didn't move. Danny reached around behind him and opened a door. Again I heard explosions, three of them, and caught a momentary glimpse of the dark, oily face of Mike Marcotti's brother. He must have followed me, or perhaps he'd been out there before we came. I saw Danny collapse. They picked up Nick Marcotti in St. Louis, but they electrocuted him here. The fingerprints of Buster Cowan in Washington checked with the fingerprints of Danny, and they found the scars on Danny's face near the hairline. His widow gave him a fine funeral, nevertheless. I heard later that she married some old gent with millions, and it might be true, but I didn't want to believe it. Jeff Revolt offered me a job, and it paid a lot more than my business, but I turned him down. Ethics, I guess. I keep wondering who that guy was who died at Tarawa.